Well, hey there, my name is Robert Smith, family pastor here at Calvary. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, thanks for joining us, Church Online, today. Uh, you know, this is an interesting time we find ourselves in. We're in a series called Pandemic Playlist. And, you know, the interesting thing is a couple months ago, Pastor Chad came up with this idea and said, hey, I want to I wanna speak into some of the, the topics and phrases that are, are kind of dominating our world right now. And, and we love the idea as a teaching team, and we started to develop that. And then uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, we were getting ready to, to kind of get it started. And I went, man, did we miss the moment here? Do we miss the, the opportunity to really speak in and for this to apply to the, the time that we find ourselves in? Uh, and, but yet God has a sense of humor. And here we are yet again in, you know, a, a state of shutdown from COVID and, and in that place of doing church online again. So God has a sense of humor in the timing of these things. But it all shows us that 2020 is just completely unexpected in every way. 2020 has continued to deal with things that are just completely unexpected and unprecedented in them. Um, but also for honest, they've dealt us things that we don't really like or enjoy. And one of them is social distancing. And that's going to be our topic today. We're going to be talking about social distancing. And no, I'm not going to be saying, you know, the health benefits of it and how you can do it in this place, in this setting, in this way. Rather, I want to talk about what it actually means for us as, as God's people, us as humans and how we're created and wired by God from the beginning. Because, you know, it's interesting to look at the effects, but also the, the impression of social distancing. When it first started, the introverts all around the world went, yes, this is amazing. You know, some of my friends said things like, I've been training for this my whole life. Or they said things like, nothing's going to be different about my social life as a result of social distancing. But but then the interesting thing is that, that almost immediately extroverts hated it. Uh, I, I'm on the extroverted scale and I, and I knew immediately that I would hate this because it meant less face-to-face -face interaction with people, smaller groups, less mass gatherings, all the things that, that I enjoy about being around people would be lessening. And, and I also knew that this would have a lasting effect uh, because of its just sweeping application to our world. Everywhere was doing some form of social distancing. Some of it was, was very official. You know, we were shut down here at Calvary for 10 weeks in the spring. It was a very official thing. But there's also some unofficial aspects of this whole social distancing thing. I remember early on in March, I was at Bash's, I was buying some produce and uh, they have those giant kind of islands in the produce section with a fruit and the vegetables and stuff like that. And I walked across the aisle to grab some, some fruit. And on the other side of this kiosk was a lady also buying some stuff. And as I walked across the aisle up to this little island of fruit, she looked at me like I was a terrorist and every step I took closer, she stepped away. And, and it's comical to think about, but in that moment, moment, I realized that this idea of social distancing would have incredibly long lasting and sweeping effects because it, it, it encouraged us to rewire how we interact with other people, how we view relationships and, and interactions. And it rewired us of how we were created to be. And so I wanna go back and, and look at this from the beginning and say, how were we created as people, as human beings to interact in the world? And how does that change how we should view this moment in time right now? So so I'm going to start in the book of Genesis. So uh, Genesis chapter one, it's the very beginning of the Bible. If you've got a Bible at home, you can tune. I'm just going to read one verse. But, but the book of Genesis gives us the, the explanation of the beginning of everything. God creating the world, God creating everything in our life. And in Genesis chapter one, verse 27, it says this. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, it means that you were created to connect with God. You were created and wired to connect relationally with God, that from the beginning, that's how you were created, that's how you were wired, that's how God made you uniquely. And, and it, it explains here that that's because we are created different than anything else in all the world, that we are created in the image and likeness of God. And that's what separates us from, from the animals, from the plants, from the things of our earth, that, that we are created, uh, Genesis says, to have dominion and rule over those things in the world because we carry God's image. We have attributes and, and characteristics that we import directly from God himself. And that's because we carry his image. 
Now, in the beginning, you see this so clearly. You see it and understand the fact that, that we're created to be relationally with God. Because if you look at those first two humans there in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they're there in the garden relationally connected with God. They're walking with God. They're talking with God. Every day they're, they're strolling through the garden. Everything's peachy, right? And then something changes. And when you get to Genesis chapter three, there's a significant change that happens. I'll summarize it here for us. But what happens is Adam and Eve choose to rebel and sin against God. They, they disobey the command that God had given them regarding one of the trees and they bring sin into the equation and into the world. Now what happened as a result of this was distance was created in their relationship with God. See, almost immediately they realized what they had done. They realized the issues that they carried. And it says that Adam and Eve, they withdrew, they covered themselves, they hid. In fact, that very day, God enters the garden and Adam and Eve are hiding. God calls out to Adam, Adam, where are you? Why are you hiding? See, we don't immediately recognize the significance of this moment until we start to read more of scripture and get the big picture. But what this has shown us there at the very beginning is that sin creates a separation between us and God. And Isaiah 59, two spells it out very plainly. It says that our sin creates a separation between us and God. And we, we see that and we feel it. Maybe you're at a point right now, or maybe you have been, where you're like, man, I know the life I'm living is not what it should be. I know I'm not following God the way he wants. I'm not walking the right path, but it seems so far away to actually do that. And maybe that's not you, but maybe you're at a place where you're like, man, I've been following Jesus for a long time, but you know, these last couple months, I've fallen into some issues. I've made some mistakes. I, I've done some things I shouldn't. And I just feel like God's so far away from me. What do I do? And the truth is that the, the reality of the gospel, the good news of Jesus applies to both of those situations equally. The truth that, that Jesus came to, to fix that issue of distance, that, that God looked at our world and understood that our relationship as, as humanity with him, our creator needed to be restored, not just uh, globally, but individually as well. And so he sent his son Jesus to, to live a perfect and sinless life, to model what we should be doing, to give us an example in every single way. But then to go to the cross, to take all the punishment, all the condemnation, all the judgment, all the punishment that we deserve on himself. So that if we believe in him, we would find forgiveness, we would find mercy, we would find grace. Our relationship would be restored. Today, maybe you're at a place where like, I, I know that I've got a lot of distance in my relationship with God. Maybe you feel that, maybe you're like, I'm not where I should be in terms of my walk with God, or maybe I haven't even started that. If that second one's true, if you haven't even begun a relationship with Jesus, we wanna invite you to, to explore that today. And maybe you're not ready to commit, maybe you're not ready to say, yes, I'm in, but maybe you're at a point where you say, okay, I'm willing to entertain and, and learn. And if that's you, we wanna encourage you to take a next step and, and just process that with us. If you're watching on our website, there's gonna be a button that pops up right now. Just click that button and it's gonna take you to a website to, to read and learn and explore. If you're on Facebook, that link's gonna pop up. If you're watching on your TV at home, on YouTube, we wanna encourage you, grab your smartphone or a device that's nearby, go to calvarylhc.com slash next. Because we want you to walk through what those next steps look like and just explore what a relationship with Jesus is. But if you are at a place where you say, Jesus is my savior, I've made a commitment to follow him with my life. We also wanna challenge you of, of how are you growing in that relationship during this time? Because for many of us, you know, we aren't classified as essential workers. Uh, we're not, you know, busy and working like crazy. If you are an essential worker, man, we're praying for you. We're thankful for you. We pray you get some rest here soon. But if you have some extra time on your hands, if this pace of life has slowed down for you these last few months, we wanna challenge you to use that well. We wanna challenge you to, to really explore what that looks like to, to really dive into God's word, to say, hey, I'm gonna actually read this and study it like I never have before. And, and if you don't know where to start, 
we've got a reading plan that uh, will be available on our website that we're reading through the New Testament this year. Or maybe you're just saying, hey, I'm just going to jump into the Gospels. One of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. These are the stories and accounts of Jesus' life. And, and it will help you understand who he is, what he did, what he said. But maybe you just need to take some time in extended prayer and just spend some time talking to God. Maybe get away, go out to the wall of pies or get out of town for a little bit. Maybe you need to take some time and just journal and, and process and write down some of the things that God's been saying to you, teaching you, revealing to you. Maybe you'd need to take some time uh, to, to fast and to pray and spend time with God that way. I don't know what that next step looks like exactly for you, but I wanna challenge you to look for it and to take it. Because the truth is, if we are not growing with our connection and relationship to God, every other aspect of our world will, will suffer. Every other connection in our life will be hindered if we're not connecting to God well. So we're created to connect with God. But as you keep reading through the book of Genesis, you see that you were also created to connect with others. You're created to connect with others. As you read through Genesis 1, it gives an account of, of every aspect of our world that God creates. You know, it starts, the, the earth is, you know, empty and void and, and nothing existed. And God begins to speak into existence all the things of our world. And the amazing thing is he has this refrain throughout the, the, the first chapter of Genesis that, that God would speak and create something. Then it says that he would pause and look at it and reflect. And then over and over, seven times through chapter one, it says, and God saw what he had done and it was good. There's this, there's a beauty and in, in symmetry of, of God creating and going, yes, it's good, it's perfect. And then when you get into chapter two, it, it goes into more detail on how God created us as humanity. And in, in verse 18, we see something really significant. It, it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And it goes on to say how God created Eve, the, the first female, and how God intended them to connect in marriage and, and to, to work through that. But it shows us that we were created to connect with other people. And, and at the beginning there, that, that immediately starts with just our connection with our family, our immediate nuclear family, our spouse, our, our children, our extended family. That's what God created you for. We were not created to live in isolation, to live alone, to live without people. And, and that's why so much of the social distancing, I think, grates against our wiring because at some level, we all understand that we were created to be with other people. We're created to connect. We're created to have people that we share life with, that we share hopes and dreams and aspirations and frustrations and angers with, that we have someone to walk through life relationally with. And this starts, I think, with our spouse. And if you're married, you get this. If you've been married a while, you understand the, the significant role that a marriage plays in your life. And my wife and I, uh, we just celebrated 10 years of marriage earlier this year. And I know some of you are watching and you're like, are you even old enough for that? Did you get married in the South where there's different laws and all that? No, like uh, if you look close, I have gray hairs that prove I'm old enough to be married for a decade. But what I saw through this the last you know, few months of reflecting back is that, that I realized that the, the, the marriage that my wife and I share is a fulfillment of God's design for each of us, how, how we were created and wired for this. And so know that that's true for you. Your marriage, your family is a fulfillment of God's design for your life. So with that, how are you stewarding that? How are you taking care of that marriage? How are you taking care of your family relationships during this time? And a question to kind of examine this is, would you say your marriage is stronger or weaker, that you're closer or further away from your spouse as a result of the last four or five months of this COVID crisis? And it's easy to just blame COVID and say, you know, it's Auntie Rona's fault and, and blame it at that. But in reality, it's us. If we've got issues in our marriage and our relationship, the, you know, it's a two-way street, not a highway and a bike path. Like we've got some involvement there too. So. So how is your relationship with your spouse if you're married? If you've got kids at home, how are you investing in them during this time? How are you uh, encouraging them and speaking truth and hope and love and purpose into their life? Because the truth is 2020 will be remembered. There's no way we're ever going to forget this year. And your kids, no matter how old they are, they will remember this year. They'll remember 2020. 
And they'll also remember how you as a parent handled it, how you navigated this. They'll remember if you spoke with truth and encouragement and grace and kindness and hope, or they'll remember if you spoke with, with anger and, and frustration and bitterness and, and, and hate. They'll remember if, if you spent time with them, if you made memories, if you found creative ways to go do things with them, or if you were just angry and frustrated and held up in the living room, yelling at mainstream media on the TV. They'll remember this year, so how will you spend it? Because we were created to connect with others and your kids want you to connect, your spouse wants you to connect during this time. But also understand that this, this creation for connection also extends into our, our friends and our acquaintances. See, I think this is the area of our social life that's been hit the hardest. It's those, those friendships and those acquaintances, those people that we're used to rubbing shoulders with, but now can't. Because before coronavirus, you know, we had, we had social events, we had concerts, we had movies, we had, you know, large dinner parties, we got together that way. But now a lot of that has changed. A lot of that is, is on hold for a season and shut down. Uh, you add in the mix of, you know, COVID scares of, oh, I was exposed to someone at work, so I need to distance for a couple weeks, or I have it, so I'm going to be out for a month. You've got all these things. And it's, it's, gotten us to a point where we distance. See, social distancing was never meant to, to be relational distancing, but yet that's exactly what we've made it to be. And, and I think the biggest aspect of that is with our friendships. And early on in March, when all this started, you saw so many people working hard to overcome this. They were using Zoom and FaceTime and Skype and house party and messenger to connect and video chat. And they're like, oh, I can't come to your house, but let's do a game and house party or I can't, we can't do life groups. So let's do it on Zoom and everything's gonna be great. And then about April or May hit. And I think our society just had a collective groan of exhaustion because we realize that connecting digitally isn't the same as connecting face to face. It takes a lot more effort, it takes a lot more work. It doesn't make you feel the same way as a result. And there's a collective groan. And I think many of us have just stepped back from that. But I wanna challenge you right now to, to maybe st step out of the frustration, the burnout, the exhaustion you feel about our state of affairs right now. And maybe you're even in a place where you're burnt out from doing church online and not being here in person, worshiping with us. And trust me, we get it. We're with you there. But, but I wanna challenge you for a second to step back from this because the reality is that, is that we were created to connect with others, but we we're also created to make a difference. We were created by God to make a difference, to, to speak into people's lives in a way that changes them and encourages them. And God reminded me of a passage that, that I've long loved and, and just used as inspiration and direction in my life. And that's Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. It says this, it says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. I love this passage because it just inspires me with purpose and hope and meaning in my involvement in the world, but also because it's pretty direct with how that actually works, what I'm supposed to be doing as a follower of Jesus. And, and as we kind of wrap up today's message, I, I want to just break down those two examples and analogies that Jesus uses for our life. Because first he says that we are the salt of the earth. And I don't know about you, I'm a salt user. I love putting salt on my food. And there's probably going to be a point in my life that I have to repent of this, but I'm still young and dumb. So I'm going to enjoy salting my steak and my roast and all my foods. But there's, there's a reality we all understand with salt, and that is that salt has to interact with your food. It has to touch and connect with your food in order for it to make a difference. If I've got a steak on my plate at the kitchen table, I've got to go to the cabinet and get the salt shaker and then come pour it out on my steak if I want it to make a difference. 
In the same way, if we wanna make a difference in people's world, we have to be in their life. We have to be connected to them. We have to be invested emotionally, relationally, spiritually in their life. And you're saying, Robert, I, I know that, but social distancing, I can't. Hey, we don't have to be physically close in order to relationally and spiritually connect and invest in people's life. We have to be there. But when we look at these two examples, I think that Jesus presents two examples that, that for us in this day in history show that we've got two dangers, two risks as we navigate this as followers of Christ. And the first is that I think we bear the risk of losing our taste as Christians. Not because we, we've got COVID symptoms, we have no say, ta sense of taste or smell, but because we're losing sight of how God created us and how he wired us and what he created us for. I, I think that we carry the risk of losing sight of how God has wired us to speak hope and purpose and meaning and reconciliation and love and kindness and grace into people's life. And instead, we're caught up with controversies, we're caught up with our political frustrations, we're caught up with the frustrations of how our world's playing out and how things are canceled and not how they should be. And we instead use our voice to speak hate and condemnation and frustration and anger and division and divisiveness. Christians, don't lose your taste. Don't lose the taste of what God created you to do, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Don't lose the taste of how you're created to serve and love people and make a difference. Don't lose the taste of how God has wired you to, to bring hope and meaning into people's life. Because when you look around our world in many circles and situations, it's honestly pretty difficult to see the difference between the believing world and the non-believing world. And this reached a, a bit of a tipping point for me last week, uh, last Friday, in fact. I was just reflecting on our world and what was going on. I was reflecting on the people that, that I follow online because so much of this problem exists on social media. And, and I was looking at this and just reflecting on the Christians that I was seeing in the world, some of which I know, many of which I don't. And it was just broken over the fact that they were using their voice to speak hate and condemnation and anger and division instead of love and joy and grace and peace and the things that God's created us for. And I was done. And so I'm sitting there in the parking lot after an appointment that I had and was in the, the lobby just scrolling through some things and just frustrated through my whole appointment. I got into my truck and I just started deleting stuff on my phone. I deleted the news app. I deleted all the different news agency apps that I had on my phone. I deleted Facebook. And honestly, if it weren't for me being on the, the Calvary social media team, I was going to delete my Facebook account altogether because I was done. And, and it got me to thinking, man, if, if a pastor a Christian is tired and burnt out from the message and, and the voices of the Christians in this world, what's the non-believing world think? And it's amazing to see what clarity can do in a moment and how getting rid of noise for just a little bit of time can, can help you. Because I went back to this passage and, and reflected more on the second example. And the second example is that we are the light of the world. And see, Jesus tells us that we're the light of the world. And ever since I was a little kid, I've loved this because I've loved flashlights. I've loved light. I've loved adding light to things. I remember I went on vacation as a kid and, you know, we got some money to buy a souvenir and we're in a store. And what does little Robert buy? I buy one of those square battery, six volt, big flashlights. And I was excited. I love flashlights, big ones and little ones, cheap ones and expensive ones. I add lights to my truck. I add lights to my dirt bike. I love lights because light changes everything. If you're in the dark and you can't see where you're going, light changes that. If you're in the dark and you're confused and worried over or making a mistake and getting hurt, light changes that. If you don't know how to navigate and how to work through a place, light changes that. If you're in the dark and overwhelmed by fear and anxiety, light changes that. And Jesus says, we are the light of the world. But he says, the danger we face is taking our light and hiding it and putting it under a basket. And I realized after a few days of just stepping out of, of social media and just distancing there, I realized that while I could beat up on others for, for their behavior online, 
Matthew 5 condemned me on the backside by saying, hey, if you choose to step out of this, you choose to give up your right to speak hope, to speak purpose, to speak life into people's situations. And, and by withdrawing from that, I was saying, I no longer have the option. I'm putting my light under a basket. And God began to show that to me and remind me of, of the truth that I learned as a little kid. That no matter how dark something is, no matter how dark a room or a forest or the desert is at night, a flashlight overcomes the darkness. And the same is true of our world. No matter how dark our world can get, no matter how bleak and dark and depressing our moment in time can be, you know what overcomes that? Light. Scripture says that Jesus is the light of the world who overcomes darkness. Jesus brings hope and meaning and purpose and fulfillment and grace and truth into our life. And that light overcomes all darkness. And so Christians, don't put your light under a basket. Our world needs people who are willing to speak up with grace and truth and kindness and love and compassion in this time. Don't put your light under a basket. See, the, the interesting thing is that, that the current situation we're in with the social distancing and the, the fear of dying from a pandemic and all this should have the unbelieving world turning to Christians and saying, what can we do? What should we do? Where can we find hope? Christians should be the ones speaking with faithfulness and truth and peace and confidence because of Jesus and, and Jesus working in our life. And yet so many Christians have wasted the moment, have missed the opportunity, and they've either lost their taste and spoken about things that don't really matter. They've theorized about things they could never know the answer to and, and really make no progress in getting there, or they've put their light under a basket and said, I'm not going to be involved at all. And I want to challenge you today to remember that you were created to make a difference, and the way we do that is by connecting with people. Here at Calvary, we believe that life change happens best in the context of relationships. So you were created to connect and to use those connections to make a difference. And our world is discouraging and, and hopeless at times, but don't let that keep you from either losing your taste or putting your light under a basket. But instead, remember that you're created to connect. You're created to connect with God. Use this time, use the extra time that you have right now to connect, to grow in your walk with God. You're created to connect with others. How are you improving your marriage and your relationship with your family? How are you connecting with the friends and acquaintances in your life? And you're created to make a difference. Go be salt and light to our world right now. Go be a refreshing representation of Jesus by being salt in those difficult situations. Go be light and bring hope and peace and encouragement to those moments that are dark and depressing and hopeless. Because following Jesus changes everything. And we hope today that you would not let the, the social distancing reality of our world keep you from connecting with God and connecting with others so that you can make a difference. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the fact that you created us for relationships and connection. I thank you that you created us to connect with you, to, to have a life-changing relationship with your son, Jesus. And I thank you that, that that relationship changes everything, that it allows us to find hope and purpose and forgiveness and grace in life. God, thank you for, for coming and closing the distance that our sin created. And God, we just ask today that in the midst of one of the weirdest moments that many of us have ever lived in, you help us to find ways to connect with others, to find ways to be involved emotionally and relationally and spiritually in their life so that we can make a difference. God, we want to be salt and light to this world, so help us to do that. Help us to go and be a refreshing representation of your son Jesus to the world around us and bring your light and hope and purpose into those dark places. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.